Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with The Private Room. And today we have a special interview with AP Hill. And we are really excited about this because I saw some of his posts um, that made me reach out to him and say, what the heck happened to you? And tell us, where are you now? So we are doing this special interview with him. We've had a nice week of special interviews um, with people that I wanted to get on the calendar um, immediately. And he is one of those people because he has a story to tell. And I think something that um, his story is something that everybody can learn from, but then also to really raise some awareness around um, violence in our communities and the way it affects the person afterwards. Um, I have several friends that are on my um, friends list and within my networks who have lost children to um, gun violence and um, just community vi violence overall. And so our guest tonight is a survivor. He is a survivor after being shot multiple times um, and I'm going to let him expand on that a little bit more, but tune in, listen to his story, chime in in the comments, I will be reading them, and let's just really dig deep to find out um, what this man, young man had to go through and how he's doing now, and how we can support him and his goals for the future. So hello, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. All Good. right. Good. I didn't want to give too much of your story because I want you to give your own story and your own testimony. So um, we're just going to start from the beginning. Um, tell us how old are you and where you grew up and let's get some background on you before we get into um, the meat of our story. Well, um, I'm Charlotte. I grew up on the west side of uh, Charlotte. I'm 26 years old. Um, I have a daughter. She's five years old. Aww. And how long ago did the incident happen that we're going to talk about tonight? Well, it happened on the day of uh, March uh, 21st, 2021, uh, about two years ago coming up. Wow, um, that's not too long ago. So it was like right dead smack into um, COVID and this happened to you. So I know that you, not only did you suffer a very traumatic experience, but on top of it, you probably had to deal with a lot of limitations of COVID and, you know, being hospitalized and your recovery and all of that, that kind of stuff. Um, so um, can you kind of tell us what happened on the day that um, you almost lost your life? Tell us what happened. Well, what happened on the day, well, March 2020, I mean, March 21st, 2021, is um, I was taking my daughter to the park. You know, it was a nice sunny day. Um, and we went to the park to have an amazing time. I had her, her mom dropped her off and stuff. And my mother gave us a ride to go to the park. So we were playing for about three or four hours. And um, on the way back, I decided to let her walk up down the sidewalk, you know, because I didn't want her to walk, you know, uh, the train track way, which is the shortcut of me getting to the park. So um, we walking down the street and uh, this dude, he pulls up and he's, you know, he's very, you know, aggressive. And I go up to the car, you know what I'm saying? I, he says, what's up, pussy boy? And he shot me in the, uh, in the groin, you know, and I was shocked. And then when he got out of the car, you know, most of the shots started to hit my stomach. I had pushed my daughter away. She uh, started crying immediately. Um, that being said, I'm on the ground. I could laugh like, you know, my legs were numb. I thought that I was paralyzed, you know, but um, little grace of God, um, as he proceeded to leave after he shot me multiple times in my stomach and in my groin area, I get back up. Then he doubles back. And uh, as I get back up, I try to get away. You know, I, I try to get away because now I am painting the grass red with gunshot wounds. Um, I got shot two times in the leg, you know, um, in my thigh. You know, as I, as, as I am calling away, you know, just trying to, you know, escape from this dude, um, he starts to shoot even more. You know, so I'm hitting me, so I'm hitting the ground, you know, the bullets. Uh, making that dirt kick up. Um, I finally find, you know, I finally get the energy to 
push up on someone's porch, lift myself up on someone's porch, where I then balled into a ball, you know, because the gunshot wounds, they were bleeding, and I was trying to cover the ones that actually mattered. So when he proceeded to leave, he shot me before, he shot me in the right arm, which is the vein, the main vein, of my arm, and gut and blood just started going everywhere. By this time, my mother, well, my sister at the time, they were calling the police and everything. And um, I had a friend of mine, he came over there to rest by my side and he started to help me hold the uh, the wound to my arm, which is the main vein on, the, on my right arm that was gushing out a lot. He uh, helped me put a little bit of more pressure on it. Um, so as I'm waiting on the ambulance, I'm thinking, you know, like, why does, why, why does this have to happen to me? Why did it happen to me on this day where I had my daughter? You know, uh, I was just, you know, that gave me, you know, when I saw my daughter crying as I'm laying on the ground, it just gave me a lot of, um, a lot of fight, a lot of hope, you know, just to stay alive. Um, it was very tra traumatizing, you know, it was horrific. Um, I, I didn't do anything wrong to this dude, you know, I, I, I didn't do anything drastic to make this dude want to come and kill me. You know, I really can't pinpoint the reason of why he shot me. Um, and I don't understand why he did this in front of my daughter. You know, that, you know, that, you know, that has a lasting effect on her. It has a lasting effect on me. You know, so as I make it to the hospital and I'm in the back of the ambulance, I'm going in and out, you know, just trying to stay alive, trying not to go to sleep. Cause I was really, really tired at the at the at the time, you know, and I could feel myself slipping away and fading away, and um, I was just, you know, just trying to, just trying to survive. It's kind of like you know, uh, being in a real game of uh, Call of Duty, you know, when you uh, get shot up and then there's a man on the ground and you're trying to crawl away. If anybody ever played Call of Duty. That was my uh, experience, you know. I barely got away, you know. Um, I thought that I was gonna get. I thought I was gonna die. To be honest, mm. um, and it, it was a struggle for me to stay awake. It was very. I mean, I couldn't even cry at the moment because my daughter was crying. You know, when I uh, first got shot initially, um, only thing that I could do was try to protect her you know, be the protector for her, you know, try to get her out of the situation. Luckily, she didn't get shot because I took all of them, you know. So as, as I'm in an uh, ambulance, you know, like I said, I'm fading in and out. You know, it's a lot of thoughts that start, thoughts that started to um, come by, like rush by, rush in my head. You know, a lot of thoughts came, came up. Um. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about my family, my daughter, and everybody that I would miss, you know, and everybody that I would leave behind. Um, I felt like, like maybe why, you know, maybe this is my time. I didn't want to die. I was scared to. Um, and that is what happened that day. I mean, it was just very traumatic and very horrific. Hmm. I'm sure it was. How old was your daughter at the time of the shooting? Well, she was four. She was four. She's five now. Hmm. You know. Um, yeah. So you said that your mom was dropping you off at the park with your daughter, right? Yes. So I'm assuming that they didn't. This it sounds like this happened pretty immediately after you got dropped off. No, it actually happened like three or four hours later because um, oh, okay. yeah, I walk, I walk, I was, I, walk, I let my daughter walk down the sidewalk. Okay, and I was walking, you know, walking back to my house. Okay, okay, so you and your daughter went to the park. Y'all were there for a couple of hours, and you were on your way home. Yes. When this happened, did do you know the person? Yes, I knew the person. I knew the person, but I didn't think that we had issues like that to for him to try to come and shoot and kill me you know what i mean i mean there was no really no physical altercation like we never fought 
probably argue about one or two things, but that wasn't really relevant to shooting a person. They didn't mm-hmm. do anything to this person. I didn't steal from this person. I didn't, like, you know, rob this person. I didn't do anything to deserve something like that happening to me. Yeah. So you know this person, he just opened fires on you out of the park in front of your daughter. Um, it sounds like you managed to at least get close to home. You said your sister called the the police and the ambulance. Yeah. It was yeah, it was pretty close to home. It was right across the street from my mom's house. You know, um, on the west side of Charlotte, mm-hmm. over there on Hovis Road near Bradford. Mm-hmm. Near, near the store. Mm-hmm. But the uh it was a house, it was by the house in front of my, my mom's, mm-hmm. like right across the street. We got a main road that runs right there. Mm-hmm. And we was walking on the sidewalk and uh, everything transpired. Mm. I cannot imagine what your mind was going through otherwise than, I guess, first thing, my daughter, making sure that my daughter is safe. And then secondly, trying to keep your strength so that you can make it through this whole thing. Yes, that that was the, that 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 was the idea, you know, uh, just trying to stay alive, stay awake, because I was getting I was getting sleepy, and yeah. in my head that was a sign for me that I was either fading away or I was just gonna, you know, either die. I mean, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how I survived it. I just know that I did. Yeah, God was with me. Yeah. Um, With this happening to you, well, my next question is, is that they catch him? Did they catch catch the person that tried to kill you? Yes, they caught the person that they they tried to kill me. You know, he's in custody and he's gone for a very, very long, long time. Um, I cannot, you know, right now I am not in the forgiving stage even you know even thinking about forgiving this first for what you did because not only did it affect me it affected my daughter yeah. you know and it, it, affect, it affected me you know for the rest of my life you know physically and mentally yeah yeah i um forgiveness is is a it's hard when one you don't even understand the reason behind it um, and then two, this is an act of violence that I'm pretty sure was not warranted. No, no kind of violence is warranted in any way, shape or form. But you said that y'all didn't have any beef like that that would even give him any kind of reason to do this to you. And then he does this in front of your daughter. He could have killed your daughter. He could have killed both of you. And that would have been two people in your family that would be gone for something senseless. Right. That's exactly what, that's exactly how I feel. You know, um, maybe that I think about that, I just, I just thank God for keep, him keeping me alive. Actually, him uh, helping me protect my daughter. You know, because uh, that was, you know, horrific. You know, uh, it affected like, you know, like the way that me and her mom interact now. You know, she's very much skeptical about letting me, you know, see her by myself, which I totally get, you know, because. I get that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't blame. Yeah. Yeah. I, I as, a, as a mother, I can definitely understand that because my thing would be, you don't know why he did what he did. And so because you don't know why, how do we know that it won't happen again? Like, how do we know that there's not, someone that's going to follow up or whatever because you don't know what it was so I can definitely understand how she probably feels probably every time you pick up your daughter it's like okay are they going to be safe are they coming back you know and and all of that I I, as a mother I'm not really sure how I would feel about you even taking our daughter anywhere Um, and that's not against you that's just because I want to make sure that my child is safe so I can only imagine how she probably feels, you know, um, because she almost lost her child too. Not just your mom, your mom almost losing you. She almost lost her child as well. Right, right. 
Yeah, um, that could have happened, you know, and I, I think about that on daily, you know, and uh, very thankful that it did. Yeah. I can't blame, I cannot, I cannot blame her mother for, you know, taking precaution, you know, whenever I'm down, I'm around my daughter, you know, because she was, you know, put in a very dangerous situation. Yeah. You know, something that she didn't have nothing to do with. You know, something that I don't even know the reason why this person even did it. Right. You know, I I can't even put my finger on the reason why this gentleman did what he did, you know, to me. You know, right. I just, only thing that I can think of is, you know, probably hatred. You know, uh, it was something that I was doing that probably he couldn't do. I don't, you know, I, I can't, I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. You know. So um, <clears throat> you said that he's gone for a long time. I'm assuming that's for the attempted murder on you. Yes. Or is it for another reason? <laughs> I was on the it's an attempted mur murder on me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so he gave you no reason, even in court, while y'all were going through, through the process of um, him being sentenced and so forth, he still did not give any reason for why he did what he did? He didn't give no valid reason why he did what he did. He gave a very, like, childish reason, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, and the childish reason and being this, because he said somebody else wanted him to do it, so he had to do it, you know? And that's just not a, enough reason to even try to do something to someone who didn't do anything to you. Right. You know. Did, did we ever find out who that other person was that he was referring to? I never asked questions about who that other person was because, you know. Right. It's um, irrelevant. Yeah. What was the result of the shooting on you physically? Result of me on the, on, well, the result was that, um, Okay, I'm gonna tell you how many times I got shot. I got shot about 13 times, nine to the stomach, um, two to the thigh, one to the groin, and one to the uh, Your arm. right arm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So physically, you know, one of my feet, on my left foot has foot drop, which is nerve damage. So I cannot, you know, feel my toes on that foot. I can't raise them. I walk with a limp. Um, for my stomach, I got half a colon. I got a um, I have a cracked pelvis, and uh, my some of my intestines are taken out. You know, so I have a short, I have a shorter intestine system, um, which makes me go to the bathroom frequently. Um, my right arm, uh, they had to take a vein out of my right leg, and put it in my right arm, and save my right arm, because the main vein in my right arm was damaged, shot. Busted, mm. you know, and um, that has resulted in me. I'm having a lot, a lot of nerve damage, a lot of pain. Um, I can't walk long distances. I can't run. I can't jump. I can't even go. You know, I can't even work. You mm. know, um, it is a number on me, and you know, mm. I can't do the things that I usually usually could do, like ride a bike. Or go play basketball or even try to mow the line. You know, mm -hmm. it's a struggle with everything. Going up some stairs, carrying heavy things. You know, um, any given day I could probably break my left my left foot because I can't, I, you know, it's hard for me to walk. I have to lift my foot up. Um, because my my toes don't automatically lift up like a regular person's do without the nerve damage. Right. Um, so I'm in, I'm in constant pain and struggle. Yeah. Um, I believe I remember when looking at your page that you were in a wheelchair for a while. Are you still in a wheelchair? Do you still use a wheelchair? Um, no, I don't use a wheelchair anymore. I went from the hospital bed to the wheelchair to the walker to a cane. Um, I do use the cane. And I do have braces for my legs that I do use. Mm -hmm. um, my legs will never be the same. Um, 
and I would never be able to like function as a regular person. And you know, I walk, I walk with a limp on both of my legs. You know, my right leg gives out only frequently after I fatigue it. You know, a little going a little too hard. You know, um, being here in rehabilitation, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. I thought about giving up. You know, just giving up on everything because for one. I was in rehabilitation and I didn't have no place to go. I didn't want to go back to my mother's house because that was the place basically where I got shot, you know. Didn't want to go to that neighborhood. And um, that's what it was when I was in rehabilitation. Um, I, that's all I got. Yeah. What was your... When how well first of all, when you when they caught him, was it immediately after? Were y'all like waiting for him to be caught? How long after the shooting was he apprehended? Um, he was apprehended um probably like a week after the shooting, no more like three days to a week after the shooting, because you know, as I was in the hospital, just getting off of uh, you know, ICU. I've been in ICU for about a week. You know, and it, it was pumping, pumping morphine to my, you know, to my system or whatever. So I was out of it when they came to do the interview initially. So I only remember what I could tell them, you know, about the situation. I knew the dude, he didn't cover his face. You know, I gave them the car to look for and they called him shortly afterwards. Wow. Was he local or did it take some time to find him? Did he, did he even try to leave the state did he even try to run away how did that how did that go he tried to leave you know he he, tried, he thought they were staying in probably i believe going to south carolina or huntersville would help mm -hmm. him out you know uh but it did yeah you know um the police they probably been you know been wanting this dude you know he was a repeat offender I was know, just the about to, system. Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to ask you that. What were some of his other charges um, that he had against him that you knew of or was made aware of? Had he tried this before? Had he tried to kill someone before you? Uh, probably. You know, I can't quite put my hands on that right there because I didn't really do any research. I didn't ask him about you know, none of those previous trials what led up to him being in prison and then mm -hmm. getting out, wanted to do what he did to me and thought he was going to get away with it. You know, I, I, I really don't know his track record, but I just know that it was a bad one. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, if you, do you have your phone near you? Yeah, I do. Can you um, send me a message in Messenger with his name? I'm going to look him up. Because I want to see what other kind of charges he has, and I won't mention his name, um, because I think it's important that we that people, um, you know, we don't have a reason. He he just did what he did because somebody told him to. I mean, <laughs> do you, do you go jump off a bridge because somebody told you to jump off the bridge? Um, so you know, I, I'm curious to know what kind of record that he had um, beforehand, and then you know what the process was, you know, afterwards when he was, um, you know, when they were looking for him. And of course, that's all going to be public record. Um, your family, how did you, well, did, were you in a coma or anything after the shooting? Or you were like, were you able to respond to everybody and everything after the shooting? Or did you go into a coma or anything like that? I didn't go into a coma. It was a lot of multiple surgeries that transpired. And I went through like three or four surgeries, you know, due mm -hmm. to the injuries. Mm -hmm. um, so me being in ICU, I was, you know, put on a lot of morphine and a uh, had tube down my throat, you know, you know, one, one to three days at a time, you know. So um, it did a number on me, you know, just to go through those surgeries and have all that done. Mm -hmm. um, 
my family, they were there. My mom, particularly, was there for me. You know, and uh, then shortly after when I went through rehabilitation, I found that I was homeless because I didn't want to go back to my mom's house and I couldn't go back, you know. Yeah. Um, I found um, Freedom Fighting Missionary. Shout out to Mr. Kenny Robinson. Yes, I know Mr. Robinson. He's one of my good friends now, you know. Good. Tell me I how say, he. Yeah. yeah. Tell me how he helped you get through this. Um, Miss Kenny came. You know, when I was in rehabilitation at the uh, at CMC, Maine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was recovering, and I was laying on the bed, and you know, I was stressing, stressing out. You know, you're supposed to be recovering, but I was stressing. You know, what I mean, I didn't have any hope, so my, um caseworker for I believe social so social services mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. and um I told her that I didn't have no place to go. I was homeless, you know. And uh that is it any, you know, is there anything that y'all might can do, you know, to help me out, find some place to go. Mm -hmm. And I kinda, you know, I looked up, you know. Cause she found Mr. Robinson uh, and she gave me the information uh, of how he, of what he does, hmm. you know, and what he, what he, what he does is uh, he helps people that's incarcerated who, who, you know, trying to re rehabilitate them back to society. And uh, I was basically a new, a new, a new case for him, you know, something that he has never done before. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I was just glad, you know, to meet this man. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because I mean, to be honest, I'm from, you know, um, a place where you know somebody tells you that they're gonna do something, and I don't believe it till you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I looked at him, I looked at him like that. He was like, "Why are you looking at me like that? Like you think I'm not gonna do what I just said that I was gonna do?" <laughs> at the time, <laughs> because at the time I was like, man, I was like, I was just, I was just hoping, you know, I, I was very reluctant, reluctant mm -hmm. on what it, you know, willing to, you know, listen to what he was saying. But lo and behold, you know, through God's good grace, and mercy, He came through, you know, and He helped me out a lot, you know, from. Me getting out of my rehabilit rehabilitation and uh, getting me to my to get me to my therapy appointments and to my regular mm -hmm. appointment, um, buying hotels, you know, for me to stay, and recover, um, and just throughout my whole journey of me, you know, getting to where I'm at today, he has been there for me, you know, and that's just something that. You know, I'm I'm so blessed, you know, just to have a person like him come in my life. I mean, I believe like some things they happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. I don't like this reason, but yeah. it happened. So I'm very grateful, Mr. King, his organization, Freedom Fight Missionary. Yes, um, I'm very familiar with um Mr. Uh, Kenneth. He's been on um the private room before. Um so I, um, I'm looking at the article, um, it is public record and, um, it came up immediately as soon as I searched on his name. Um, and it says that what I want was wanted to go to the article for was I wanted to see had he ever been arrested before and what kind of charges he had been arrested for before. So when it comes to your charges, he was found guilty of attempted first degree murder, assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. So he was already a felon before he um, did this um, towards you. And then also um, they, I guess, um, 
heightened the charges. I'm not really good with court terms and legal terms, all that kind of stuff. But they took into account that your daughter was present when he did this. Um, so they took that into account as well, which um, bumped up his charges and the urgency of, you know, the the conviction and what kind of sentencing sentencing, sentencing that they gave him. It was <laughs> the fact that he did this in front of your daughter without any obvious cares at all. Um, it also says that he, of course, he was a felon. So that means that um, the charges that he had, I wanna read them out. Um, so the article said that they did their own review of available records, which again, almost everything is, is public record at this point. If you're arrested, it's not only in that crazy Charlotte magazine where everybody's faces is on, which I don't, I don't know why I always grab those when I'm in Charlotte because I want to see who's been arrested. But um, <laughs> everything else is public. I, sometimes it's so funny to me, and I, I hate to say that it's funny, but um, it's just the fact that there's a whole magazine for people that have been arrested says where our society and where our community is these days, where you have to dedicate a whole magazine to, to arrest. And it's shameful, but unfortunately crime is a part of everyday life. And um, so when I do see those, those magazines, I do grab them because there's been a couple of times I've seen people in there that I know and never knew that they were capable of some of the things that I've seen in the papers. Um, so it says that um, on January 20th, um, sorry, January 1st of 2020, he was arrested on a slew of charges, including assault by strangulation and assault on a female. Three days later, he was charged with assaulting an officer while in jail. Um, he was granted a total of 52,000 secured bond for those charges. And then he was arrested again on February 25th for two more felony charges, possession of cocaine and fleeing or eluding arrest in a motor vehicle. He was granted a 5,500 um, in secured bonds for those charges. So he had the original um, bond charges, 52,000. And then this February one was 5,500. I don't know how the heck after those other charges before that, he was even out on the street, but he was. Um, so then he's charged again and got out on bond again. Um, and then exactly four months later, he was arrested for the March 2021 shooting, which is because of the shooting that he did towards you or the attempted murder on your life. Um, so it sounds like this young man uh, had a lot of uh, criminal history before he did what he did. Um, and unfortunately, he was back on, out on the streets and almost cost you your life, which makes me angry by itself. Um, I'm a domestic violence advocate. And so seeing that he was charged with strangulation of a female um, a months before he assaulted you and he assaulted a police officer, why, is, why was this man out on the street? So then you put him back out on the street and he's arrested again <laughs> for possession of, of cocaine and um, fleeing from uh, police officers and he gets out again. <laughs> and then yeah, it's he, ridiculous. Um, and he commits the the charges against yeah, you. It's ridiculous. It, it's <sighs> it's well, it, it's horrific, exactly as you said, and it's it's something that should not have ever happened to you if the charges that were against him before would have kept him in jail so that he couldn't hurt anybody else because he had no problem hurting people, obviously. So yeah, he had no problem hurting me. Yeah. And almost your daughter. Yeah, no he problem didn't hurting. care that your daughter was there when he did yeah. this. He was there. Yeah. And I pushed out boy. And uh I I don't know how he got out on those other charges. You know, uh you know Charlotte is a high crime area. Yeah. You know, and uh, a, a person dies like every day, you know, when like first, nothing new. When First 48 comes to your city, you know that you got a lot of crime in your city. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah. So it says that he was 26 years old when he was found guilty on all three counts against you um, and that he's going to spend uh, nearly 30 years in prison 
for trying to kill, it says trying to kill someone else in front of a victim's child. Yes. How did how did you feel about the conviction when he got the conviction that he got? How did you feel about that? Well, I've felt the sense of relief, but I just felt like he could have received more, you know, more time because it's a lot that I'm dealing with myself, you know, mentally, you know, um, dramatically. Um, I'm not, I was diagnosed with depression, PTSD. You know, I have to take medicine for, in order for me to go to sleep. You know, um, sometimes I wake up, you know, we live in this incident that happened to me in 2020. Um, 2021. Um, and you know, I'm always I'm struggling with anxiety. You know, I'm always looking over my shoulder. You know, um, so I feel like he could he could have got a little bit more time. I mean, 30 years is like you know a lifetime, something like that. You know, give you a lot of time to think about what you've done. You know, and wish you wouldn't have did it. You know, mm -hmm. um. Oh, that's just how I'm feeling, you know. I, I feel like it's just fate. I'm in jail, you know. Like, only eat one time a day. I mean, like, no times a day, you know. Just let him rock, you know. Because he's a monster, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm reading here that it says that um, he is expected to spend anywhere between 22 to 27 years in prison. Um, and that if he does spend that time, that he will be getting out in his late 40s to early 50s because he was 26 years old. So 30 years for him, he's still going to be young enough to cause more damage and be a threat. And hopefully, as you said, hopefully he has that time to think about his actions and how he got where he did. And that if he does get out, that hopefully he'll be a changed person. But um, that's really hard because 30 years from now, I'm sure you don't want to be worried about him getting out of jail and him being back out on the streets and possibly being a danger to anybody else. Um, when you testified against him, how was that for you? And I saw that one of the people that helped you testified as well. So how was that experience for you being able to testify against him? Well, the experience was very detrimental, you know, to my character. I mean, I had to relive each moment, you know, explaining, you know, what happened that day and how it went down. And, you know, his defense lawyer was asking me all these, you know, crazy questions, trying to, you know, um, beat my character up as a person, you know, sure. which was, you know, uh, it was ridiculous. Some of the things that he was asking me really didn't have anything to do with um, him shooting me initially, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so me having to relive those moments and, you know, go through the acts, like I had, I had, I had to act, you know, I had to act, I had to shoot get up out of the um out of the uh booth and, and show them how he shot me or you know what I was doing when he shot me, you know, and just reliving that man, it was just it was like I was in that situation all over again. I'm you sure know? it was. Um I was mad, you know, upset. I wanted to, you know, mess this dude up, huh? you know. Um just a lot of rage going through my head at the time, but I was able to, you know, still ask, you know, still testify, still answer the question that was needed for me to answer in order to get him convicted and also explain to the jury on what, what, what happened and, you know, basically paint a clear line of vision to um, why he shot me, which, which was for no reason. You know, so um, having to relive those moments, man, it brought back a lot of, you know, anxiety, you know, and uh, it had me thinking about my physical abilities, you know, what I'm able to do now and what I'm not able to do now, which I really cannot do anything. You know, I can't work a regular job and I'll never get that back. 
you know, um, my physical attributes anyway. And then mentally, mentally messed up my daughter, mentally messed up me, you know. Uh, I talked to my daughter one day and she said, um, I was like, we're going to go for, uh, you know, we was going to go to the store or something. She was like, is, is that car going to pull up? And, you know, I just started thinking, like, wow, like, she remembers it, you know, um, it's not, it's never going to leave her mind, you know, what happened that day. One day I'm going to have to explain, you know, what happened. Right. You um, know, it's just, it's just crazy. I was reading the article and it said that you and him had had an, um, a disagreement. Um, it says prosecutors say Clinton and the man he would take aim at got into a disagreement in March, 2021. So do you remember what that disagreement was and what it was about? One, you know, one day I was, you know, I, I mean, I previously knew this dude, you know, and um, we, you know, we were riding in the car one day and uh, he introduced me to his, like his girlfriend, or whatnot, and I was like, what's up, man? how you doing, you know, not, you know, trying to, like, holler at this woman, or, you know, uh, just trying to, you know, initially just holler at her, or try to, you know, get her to pay attention, and be out just saying, hey, what's up, because he was like, here, here go my boy, and I was like, hey, how you doing, mom, mm -hmm. and he took it the wrong way, and uh, I was telling him, like, man, you know, I, apologize for him, like, but I didn't mean it that way. I, I was just like, you know, sometimes it's the way that other dudes talk, you know what I'm saying? It's no offense to you. And, you know, he started saying, like, um, well, if you was here, da 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 you would have said that I would have punched you in the face. And I was like, bro, I was like, bro, I ain't mean it like that, you know? Yeah. And that was a disagreement that we had. And he, felt, he was like, I feel like I can't trust you. And I was like, well, if you can't trust me then you know he just dropped me off and that's what he did you know now, I didn't know that we was gonna retaliate you know that's the only disagreement that I that I can think of I didn't know that he was gonna retaliate mm -hmm. um trying to kill me over that you know I ain't never tested women never really talked to her on the internet or anything or made any moves toward her mm -hmm. you know and I actually told I told him like she's not even my type bro you know and well, um, as an advocate in the community and a survivor of domestic violence, um, people, men, or I'm not going to say men, abusers tend to be jealous, irrational, um, threatened, um, and insecure when it comes to the people that they date. So it makes sense that he has that history of domestic violence, and then he overreacts to another man when it comes to the woman that he's dealing with, it makes sense that he took it to the extreme, not to this extreme, but that he took it to the extreme when it, when it happened in the moment, um, which totally uh, throws out his comment or his claim that someone else told him to do it, that totally takes away that claim. Um, so now, you know, his, his reasoning behind it just doesn't look good even though, again, there's no reason at all for what he did, but I'm sure it didn't help him that y'all had that disagreement and how extreme he was in that moment. I'm sure that that didn't help either and the charges that he already had. Um, so I would like to know now when it comes to your daughter, what kind of effects are you seeing in her after all of this since she was uh -huh. Well, my daughter, you know, it's kind of like, you know, um, every time I talk to her, sometimes um, she seems a little standoffish, you know. Um, sometimes when she's around me, you know, I have to I have to get her to open up, you know, uh, which meaning, like, I have to get her to, you know, start acting like, she would like she was with her mother, you know, because when I call on video chat, she's talking and you know, uh, playing and 
all this other stuff. And then when she gets around me or she starts to talk to me, it's kind of like standoff. Like, um, maybe she doesn't, you know, want to talk to her daddy, you know. And uh, even when I see her sometimes, you know, she starts to act a little shy or, or whatnot. Um, I have to like pull, try to, you know, try hard to pull things out of her. Yeah. You know, because before the incident, I mean, she would, you know, go, you know, be a kid, you know, go running around, you know, and talk to me. We had a full blown conversation, you know what I mean? And now it's just kind of hard, you know, knowing that maybe, you know, I, and the reason why she's like this. Yeah. You know, so. Um, well, it's not really you. It's just the fact that she experienced that trauma and that experience with you. And so unfortunately, that trauma and experience is linked to you, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, is she or both of you in any kind of counseling to help y'all with the trauma and with some coping strategies and, um, you know, ways to heal from this so that your relationship isn't affected too much or more than it already well, is? Yeah, I mean, our relationship, you know, it's, 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 it's good. It's all right. It's all right with me, you know, because I know what she experienced. But um, as far as the therapy goes, um, she doesn't go to therapy. I mean, I talked to my mom about it, but she didn't because she lived with my mom she hasn't made any effort you know to put it through therapy mm -hmm. um but I do receive therapy you know to talk about my day-to-day -day activities and anxieties and you know the financial situations that I find myself in sometimes you know um I haven't really been able to provide for myself you know yeah. which I'm used to doing you know but um, we just talk about my day-to-day -day activities and what are my strengths and weaknesses, you know, and, uh, I tell her about, you know, my anxiety and my depression and how I'm feeling, you know, but then the times that I do, you know, from week to week. Right. Um, that's, that's what we talk about. That's, I do, you know, I receive therapy. And I kind of wish that she did, you know, but I guess. Well, from, from being a social worker for 10 plus years, I would definitely encourage um, getting her into counseling if her mom will um, become open to it because she suffered trauma and she experienced it with you. And that's really hard for a child to be able to process and, and express their emotions um, in a way for you to fully understand what she's going through. Now, she, I'm sure she has expressed how she feels, but we, you know, as a social worker and I'm sure as a father and as a mother, um, you know, ther therapy can be a good outlet for her to be able to share her feelings, but also it could be a good way for you and her to bond and so that she feels safer with you and maybe even mom as well so that she can start feeling safe, you know, her, you know, your daughter being safe with you. Um, so definitely we would encourage that if um, her mom and her are willing to do it because it can definitely be a big help to make sure that there's no more, there's no more barriers and there's no more walls or there's no more um, hesitance and, you know, nervousness and anxiousness behind that that can can affect your relationship, you know, as a father, as a daughter, um, as you know, co-parenting. Um, definitely, definitely um, would say to keep trying to make that happen for her because she deserves it, and um, she deserves to be able to to be safe and feel safe when she's with you. And it's not because you did anything wrong, but it's because someone else did something wrong. Um, and she might still have some fear, you know, just like I'm sure her mom does as well. So. Um, today, right now, how are you doing and what are your plans for the future? Well, today, you know, I'm, I'm all right. 
I'm in a good place. Um, I'm still, you know, uh, I'm still, you know, um, sometimes I, I still struggle. You know, I still struggle, struggle with day-to-day activities, um, cleaning, cooking. Um, I still struggle, you know, physically, you know, being able to walk any given time I can fall. Um, and I'm currently just, you know, I'm fighting for this disability. So I started getting finances going for myself because I mm-hmm. haven't been able to do anything for myself since I've been shot. Wow. And disability is is such a horrible experience to to get disability. I mean, you have to be near, near dead, near death and have absolutely nothing to get disability. And it's so, it's so horrible the way society is now. And, you know, the people that need it can't get it. And the people that don't need it have it. So um, keep fighting that fight. Um, there are several lawyers that will fight that fight for you um, without asking for money up front. Um, I know that for a fact. So if you need some um, to referrals, I can go to my sources and see if I can get some referrals for you if you don't have a lawyer already. Keep fighting for that because you deserve it. You deserve to be able to take care of yourself, to take, take care of your family. And um, being denied that is not fair to you and it's not fair to your daughter and it's not fair to your family for you to be having these added struggles for something that right. someone else did to you um, that is a, that's going to affect you for the rest of your life it's not right so don't don't give up that fight um, which I just from seeing your post and um, hearing your story one-on-one with you I can tell that you're very strong and that you are going to do whatever it is that you need to do to take care of yourself and take care of your daughter and your family. And I applaud you for not giving up because a lot of people could be worse off than you know you are. And you're here, you're alive. So enjoy that and, and, and live in that. And I'm sure that even though you have struggles, I'm sure that you're thankful every day that you're able to wake up and you're able to see the sunshine and you're able to see your daughter and um, you know, be here to, to to live out the rest of your life. And I'm just I'm yeah. very, very happy that you're here and that we were able to 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 listen to your story. Is there any way or is there anything that you're needing that you can say to those that are watching? Um, is there anything that you're needing or you're needing any assistance with that I might be able to help you with? Um um, I need, you know, I mean, and it can I, be I, just need, I, need, I, well, I just need help, you know, um, you know, I'm trying to get my car out of the shop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can start going to my appointment. Okay. You know, um, doctor's appointment. I have a you know, I'm, I'm about to have another child, you know, miraculously, you know. <laughs> yes. And I just, you know, I just need help, you know, okay. um, with the little stuff, you know. Uh, yeah. Money to take care of, you know, what I need to take care of, you know. Um, just need to get this car out. Yeah. Well, you have been heard and I'm going to look into some resources and try to talk and I'll talk to you um, after our interview um, to talk about um, maybe some suggestions, some referrals. Um, Also going to reach out to Kenny and let him know that, hey, I met AP Rich and how can I help (laughs) him um, help you um, and just try to see if I can dig deep into into some um, services and connections to see what we can do to help to help you where you're needing. Um, and I just encourage you, of course, to keep pushing forward. Um, you're alive, you're breathing. Um, just remember that every day because I'm sure it, it's, it's very hard that you are dealing with your disabilities and you know your mental health and so forth, but you are here and that is a blessing in itself. Um, and I'm very grateful to you for being willing to share your story with us um, and with me and with those that will be watching um, tonight and in the future. So I really 
truly, truly appreciate you sharing your story. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say before we end our interview? Um, I would like to say, you know, um, that I'm just what I'm grateful for. And, you know, um, I'm grateful to be able to, you know, fall, you know, and get back up. You know, I'm grateful to have another chance of life. And I'm grateful, you know, to have, you know, I still got an intact mind. I'm not going crazy. You know, um, yeah, it's struggles that I struggle with, you know, day to day, daily. And I'm just grateful for the people that's in my life, you know, period. Um, you know, um, it's just, this is one of the situations where uh, I wish that, you know, gun violence, you know, just stops, you know. Um, I don't want anybody else to go through what I've been through, you know what I'm saying? Because some people don't deserve it, man. you know. You didn't deserve just it. Don't. Right, yeah. I didn't deserve it. Yeah, well, I would love to talk to you about how we can work together to raise more awareness about gun violence in our community and some ways that we can help um, reduce gun violence. So if you're open to that, I would love to talk to you about that and put our minds together and then bring you back for a second interview to kind of follow up to see how you're doing. Is that okay? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, well, thank it you is. so much. Thank you. I appreciate you for, again, sharing with us on The Private Room with Tiffany. And we will have a follow-up episode to catch back up with you um, to see how you're doing, see how you're progressing. When is your when is your new baby due? Uh, August. Bro, okay. August. Okay. Okay. All right. So yeah. new new in the pregnancy journey with, your, with baby number two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Got Unfortunately, it. Unfortunately, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's, that's another blessing. You got blessings on blessings. So um, we will definitely um, catch up maybe after that, after August, so that we can see the baby. <laughs> okay. I don't have a problem doing that. Okay. All right. Well, Not thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, I truly appreciate you and many blessings to you. I'll be praying for you and I'm going to reach out to you so we can kind of put our minds together and see what we can do um, to help you with your goals. Um, and also to, to see what we can do in the community because you have a story to tell and people need to hear it. Yes, yes, ma'am. And I appreciate you for having me on the private room. Thank you. You're it's welcome. a nice opportunity, you know, to share my story and uh, I believe I shared it. You did. You did, and you did a very good job. <laughs> did a very good job. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for watching um, The Private Room with Tiffany with AP Rich. And please make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Instagram so that you can see how he's doing um, sometime this year, because uh, we're going to check back in with him. Um, if you have any resources for funds available to help him with getting his car fixed um, or just, you know, everyday uh, needs, please reach out to me or reach out to him um, personally. He has been tagged in our post. Everyone have a good night and thank you, AP Rich, for being on the private room. Thank you, Miss Tiffany. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. All right, good night.